Great, thank you very much, Adrian. Thank you, Celia, and thank you for coming and listening in. Um, I'm going to really uh, talk about work we've done. It's a little retrospective look at what we've done over more than 20 years. Um, is this going to... Yeah, um, and the four challenges that I've set out here, um, mainly related to one particular site, but I'll give a little bit of wider context to uh, the challenges of lake monitoring, some of the practicalities of field and, and lab work, issues of chronology. And then the last thing I want to talk about is how we might use laminated sediments to link with the historical uh, record. Uh, the wider context of this is um, that in, in the, the 90s and early noughties, we, we did a, um, a modern lake uh, survey in Western and Central Anatolia, along with a number of colleagues. Um, and we were using that partly to develop a training set to re relate things like lake water chemistry to diatoms and ostracods, but also select a number of them, the more promising ones for coring, uh, which we did. Uh, this is one lake which, which we didn't actually call, but which we sampled a rather unusual uh, donut shaped lake uh, around a volcanic crater in central Anatolia, now sadly dry. Um, we, we did know that uh, lake, laminated lake sediments exist in Anatolia from previous work at Lake Van, where I have never worked. Uh, but Lake Van is the world's largest and deepest soda lake. And um, it was known that it had laminated sediments spanning um, the Holocene, although there are some issues with its chronology. And since then, actually, there's been a deep drilling project there, which which goes, takes the record back about half a million years. But I'm not going to talk more about Lake Van. Um, the nearest we came to that was a lake in, in southwestern Anatolia, the nearest in sense that it was large and deep. This is Lake Bordeaux, about uh, 60 to 75 metres deep, depending on when you take the, the measurement. Um, and the, the, the basal part of that is um, has a, uh, or the deep water in that has an anoxic hypolimnion with uh, laminated sediments that you can see in the picture. Um, on the other hand, uh, those laminated sediments are interrupted by thick turbidites, most of which comprises detrital carbonate. So it doesn't actually make it an easy lake to work on the isotopes and um, uh, uh, preservation of, of, of things like diatoms was pretty poor and logistics were also quite challenging, as you can probably see from the photo. So actually, after a couple of years of work, we moved on to Central Anatolia to the area of Cappadocia, which is Cappadocia, which uh, is volcanic. Uh, we'd already uh, called this uh, drained crater uh, Mar Lake uh, called Eskiantigil. Gil is G O G O umlaut L is the Turkish word for a lake. Um, that has about six meters of uh, non-laminated sediments, but below that are another ten meters of uh, laminated deposits going back to the last glacial maximum. Um, very interesting record, which we have published. Um, at the same time, we didn't, counting the laminae um, in various different ways, didn't produce enough valves to match the, the known age, so that the, 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 the lake is, lake sediments are laminated, but probably not a continuously valved record. Some parts, I think, are um, are continuous, particularly in, in the Younger Dryas. And so we moved on to this site, which is really the site that I'm going to uh, talk about today, which is Nar Lake or Nargalu, which is a quite a small manageable size lake. Uh, it's 20 to 25 meters deep. Um, it's got no surface outlet, as you can see from the photo, and it's essentially groundwater fed. Um, because it's hydrologically closed, it's also uh, slightly saline, and uh, the lake, as we'll see in a minute, is lake water is stratified. Um, also worth worth noting that the lake water residence time is around 10 years, so a lot of the, the proxies related to lake water chemistry are going to give us um, a, a roughly a, a decadal average of hydroclimatic conditions. Some, some can be more rapid than that, but most are not. So why Nar Lake? Well, it's sensitive to changes in climate. Um, as you can see from the photo, uh, there's relatively little human impact on the lake catchment today. There's also rapid accumulation sediment, but above all, because the sediments 
are laminated and those laminations are forming at the present day. Um, it's also got very good preservation of bio remains such as this uh, diatom, a new taxon species and genus, which we found there and named and was Natural History Museum Species of the Month uh, at some point. Um, so we've really worked on our lake for uh, well more than 20 years now. Um, and a big one important part of that, and I think it is a very important part of, of working with and understanding uh, lakes in general, but particularly ones that are laminated, is to monitor them. And the first challenge really, and it's a familiar one I think to many people who are listening in, is that nobody will pay for long-term lake monitoring. Um, it's just not something you can get a research grant for. Um, and so things like regular plankton and water sampling, data logging, and uh, trapping of cestin and pollen from uh, outside the, the lake, uh, we have done, but um, it, it, we've improvised. I think that's the best thing to say. Some of it's been opportunistic. Some of it has been uh, linked to periods of more intensive work. And actually the last few years, uh, Warren Eastwood uh, cunningly linked it to a student field program. So he took his Birmingham students out there uh, at Easter time, along with um, students from two other uh, from two Turkish universities, and they picked up the the sediment tracks traps and did the monitoring and, and water sampling at the same time, which I thought was a very cunning linking of teaching and research. And the photo you can see there, I think, gives you an immediate idea of why it's important to monitor because these are sediment traps taken above and below the the thermocline, the, the chemocline after a year, and you can see that one is totally encrusted with carbonate and the other one is clean. Um, these are some profiles of, on the left of temperature and oxygen and on the right of oxygen isotopes. Uh, you can see that from that that the lake is clearly, these were all summer measurements, the lake is clearly stratified uh, with, um, with a, a chemocline and a thermocline um, between five and about ten meters. Uh, the other thing you can see on that in the oxygen isotope data in particular, um, two of the, 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 the profiles there are from 2001, 2002, and the other ones are from 2008, 2009. So you can see that over that intervening six or seven year period, there was a significant shift in the isotopic composition of the lake. So long term monitoring um, allows us to actually look at real time change. Um, as well as seasonal changes. And this is a, an idea of the kind of seasonal contrast you get at the lake from uh, winter and summer. The, the snow element is actually uh, interesting and potentially significant, particularly for working on uh, isotopes of silica. I'm not going to talk more about that, but it is something which we've worked on. And these are just uh, an illustration of some of the results of uh, monitoring. This is uh, the results of data logging um, of temperature through a year from July through July 2009 to, to July 2010. Uh, the top is the air temperature, at the bottom is the lake water temperature. In green, the um, temperature in the epilimnion, and in the blue, in the hyperlimnion. And you can see very clearly that the lake is stratified for about nine tenths, no, I'm sorry, nine months of the year, eight to nine months of the year, but in late November, the blue and the green lines mix. And actually in the winter where it says mixed, there are two lines there. And that's two completely different sets of records, but they are absolutely identical. And I, I would say when I first saw that, I was pretty impressed. And then uh, you have a mixed uh, water body from the end of November through to the beginning of March, and then stratification kicks in again. That also allowed us then to tie in with the period of carbonate precipitation, which occurs in late spring or early summer, um, usually primarily linked to a, a period of photosynthesis and change in lake pH. So the monitoring allowed us to confirm that, that valves forming today are indeed annual and to establish uh, lake conditions um, uh, over the year, specifically that it is a monomictic lake. Oh, we seem to have paused. Let's try again. Here we go. And these are some results over a 12 year period. And um, it allows us to uh, show that the, <coughs> the lake water isotope values, uh, the lake carbonate values, uh, the carbonate both in sediment traps and in the core tops, 
matched each other very well. So there was a, <coughs> excuse me, a very quite a significant shift in lake hydrology over the monitoring period, and it was very closely recorded in in the, the lake sediments, um, linked to a period of essentially lake level fall and to hydrological deficit, mainly climatic, but maybe not entirely. Um, so, so that I think we allowed us to tie the VARV sediment record to to neolimnology, linking neo and paleolimnology, uh, and in a way that's reassuring. Although it also I think highlighted the fact that if you only sample in a single year or a single season, uh, you can get atypical results. For example, uh, in diatoms, you can get results uh, um, biased by individual blooms in one year, which which actually um, would have a disproportionate impact. So I think the that the monitoring side, challenging though it was, was has been very worthwhile. So as a second challenge, um, going to turn to work in in field coring. Uh, uh, Nara is about was about 25 meters deep when we kicked off uh, work there, <coughs> um, and we caught it with a number of different devices. Um, ultimately, most successfully with Livingston coring, which, uh, as those of you who are familiar with Livingston coring will know, uh, involves a lot of rods. Uh, that involved something like 28 uh, rods and casing, and the sediment became increasingly hard to penetrate after about 3.5 3 to 4 metres, and essentially we had to stop at that point. So our first coring programme uh, in 2001-2002 took us back based on counting of arbs to about 2000 years, a little less than 2000 years. And we did a whole lot of work on lab work on isotopes, charcoals, diatoms uh, and on pollen, uh, which, uh, you know, which worked well, which was all very encouraging um, and with some funding support from the bodies that you can see there. But we were clearly keen to get further back and see whether the record extended further uh, into the past, into the Holocene. So in 2010, we brought in a, a bigger scale coring uh, rig with a team from uh, Chambéry in France, uh, led by Fabien Arnaud. Uh, and you can see some of the team members uh, there. This is very much a team effort. Uh, Warren Eastwood, Matt Jones, <coughs> Jonathan Dean, uh, Samantha Alcock and others. <coughs> uh, and that coring program was a successful one, and we got a, um, a, a sequence uh, which goes down, which went down <clears throat> around 20 meters, um, and also carried out um, seismic survey. Um, in terms of chronology, um, the 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 period back to 2,600 years ago, where we were able to recover a continuous VAR sequence. Um, was primarily based on uh, VARF counting. The top was coupled to short-lived radioisotope dating, lead 210 and cesium 137, which you can see there, and produced a very good mit, uh, match. Um, we did some thin section work, and you can see the typical layers there. Um, the white layer, which is the early summer layer, which is the distinctive uh, carbonate layer. And then the rest of the year was brown organic matter, some detritus and some diatoms. <clears throat> and some years we, we would have a distinctive uh, diatom bloom layer, but not every year, only about one year in three. So we did parallel counting on, on the, the cores. Um, the difference between the counts is the, the replication was pretty small. It was, less, it was better than 1%. However, we were unable to confirm that by radiocarbon because um, this is a volcanic setting and volcanic outgassing has produced radiocarbon ages for the modern sediments of 15,000 years. So um, there was a very high risk of contamination. We didn't find macrofossils. Um, so we were unable to use radiocarbon dating. So when we got further back in time, we instead used uh, uranium thorium dating on uh, late carbonates, um, which is, I have to say, quite challenging. Um, although we did have eventual success. This is coring in the 2010 programme with a bathymetric survey and a seismic survey. 
using the Uvitec stationary piston coring system. And again, the, the, the resulting cores have had a lot of lab analyses done them. And we've been fortunate in having no less than seven PhD students um, work in part or on whole on those cores, on pollen diatoms, um, <coughs> thin sections. And um, that's really been enabled us to pull the, the resulting uh, data to produce a, a more comprehensive reconstruction. <coughs> Uh, we, 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 in the field, we did triple parallel over overlapping cores um, to ensure that um, we could build up a composite sequence which as complete as possible. Uh, the cores showed that uh, about 85% of the sediments are laminated. I'll show in more detail uh, the, the sections that, that were and were not. Um, and it also has allowed, and I'm sure those of you who worked with laminated sediments will be familiar with this, to uh, achieve intercore correlation, which is far more detailed than is possible in non-laminated sediments. You can see that uh, in these three parallel cores here. On the, the left-hand box, you can see the same section uh, matching very closely. But importantly, I think it also highlights one of the advantages of laminated sediments in highlighting the fact that coring, whether we like it or not, will and often does um, distort sediment, at least in terms of the sediment depths, so that the, the right hand box here shows the same section, but they're not in the same depth position as the one on, on the left. So relatively speaking, they're, 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 they've moved. And if you didn't have laminated sediments, it would be very easy, even if you got time markers to, to tie points to connect you, to end up um, producing a composite sequence which has a false degree of precision. I think if you're doing lower resolution work, it doesn't matter. But if you're trying to do high resolution work on non-laminated sediments, I think it, coring artifacts do run the risk of, of, of producing um, some potentially false results. And laminated sediments allow us to, I think, avoid uh, that risk. So let's have a look at the um, 2010 core sequence overall, this is 21 meter record. Um, the first unit, unit one, um, has varved uh, silts, but also includes some intervening turbidites that I'll, I'll talk about more in a minute. Counting those back using varve counting goes back to 2,600 years ago, to about 600 uh, BCE. Uh, below that, the sediments are, uh, are non-laminated or la largely non-laminated, and they are part lithified. And that's part of the reason why we were unable to penetrate that using normal handheld coring methods. Um, and in fact, you know, if we hadn't had a big drilling rig, we would almost certainly have stopped at that point and assumed that there was no more that could be done with the site. Uh, but in fact, we were able to punch through those um, clearly, those sediments are then older than 2,600 years, so they're early Iron Age into the middle or late Bronze Age. Below that, however, the laminae uh, return. So that's the non-laminated unit, unit two. And below that, we returned into laminae once more. But these are much thicker in character. Uh, we were unsure initially whether they were annual or not. I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, clearly, these are older still, so probably mid-Holocene now. Um, below that, they changed again to become very fine uh, laminated carbonates with some tufa layers, very pale beige in colour. Um, and then in the, in the underlying unit, um, the sediments were not unlike in unit six, not unlike unit one, but lacking turbidites. I don't know whose phone is going, it's not me. <laughs> Um, there's um, also a non-laminated unit at about just a little less than 20 metres depth. Um, uh, and uh, analysis, initial analyses of the cores using isotopes and other things suggested quite strongly that that represented the Younger Dryas. So we were provisionally able to identify the, uh, the Younger Dryas or the start of the Holocene boundary um, from that. And that allowed us to make some initial tentative ideas about age depth. So we had the upper unit one going back 2,600 years. We could tentatively identify the start of the Holocene and then count up 
and that took us to about 6,000 years ago, and that all looked fine. You can see that looks like a pretty even um, uh, sedimentation. So then we turn to the uranium series to do uh, uh, some confirmation of that, and we got a very nice date from the start of the Holocene, more or less bang on. So that confirmed uh, strong suspicions about uh, the the basal or near basal age of the core, but it also produced an age in unit three, which lay quite substantially off the line, the gradual uh, a line which we might have assumed uh, joined uh, the upper part to the lower part. And that actually ties to the fact that unit three, the, the, the sediments are very, th the, the laminations are very thick. And the evidence in fact did suggest on closer examination that there's there's no reason why they shouldn't have been annual. And uh, we've added that in. So it looks in fact, as if um, we've got gradual accumulation in the top part, in most of the bottom part, but in the middle in units two and three, we've got some significant changes in accumulation rate, and we infer that probably between units three and four that there is likely to be a hi hiatus um, for reasons which we're not fully clear about, but may not be climatic. I think it may well be to do with volcanic activity. The sediments are actually quite badly deformed uh, immediately around that, so there is a strong suggestion that there was some volcanic or volcanic tectonic activity which disturbed sedimentation at that point. So overall, um, the, the, the sediments were laminated throughout, apart from the two blue units there, and those non-laminated units are almost certainly due to low lake level, uh, breaking up the lake stratification and therefore indicative of dry climatic condition or, or low water balance, which is negative. And there are two periods which you can see there. The first is the Younger Dryas, so Younger Dryas was was almost certainly cold and dry. And the other one is this period in the um, uh, the later Bronze Age, early Mid and Bronze Age to the early Iron Age between about 4,200 and 2,600 uh, years ago. So overall, we've got a nice sequence for the late Holocene. We've got a very interesting sequence also for the early Holocene, but in the middle, in the mid Holocene, there's a bit of a mess. So I'm uh, gonna talk primarily uh, for the remainder about the late Holocene where the sequence is secure, but I think it's worth just highlighting the fact that the um, the early, scene, early Holocene uh, VARB record is also very uh, interesting and potentially significant, not least because this area was very important archaeologically uh, in terms of the origins of Neolithic agriculture. Um, you can see here one Neolithic uh, settlement site, this is Ashiklehuyuk, um, very close to Nar Lake, and in the background is the the, the volcano uh, Hasanda, dating to around 10,000 years ago, 8,000 BCE, and right at the very beginnings of farming. And some of the results are, are that from from Nar, I think, are very useful and important as far as that's concerned. Um, the only other thing I'll say about this earlier part of the record is that I think it does uh, provide us with some interesting evidence about uh, climatic changes during the late glacial uh, to early Holocene transition. And this is the these are the data on stable isotopes from Na in blue and in Eskiagigal, the other record in orange. Now, uh, Na is not laminated for the Younger Dryas, so we can't do a valve count for that. Uh, Eskiagigal is laminated. We're not 100 percent sure it's annual, but we think it probably is. And what we can see from that is um, that the full range of glacial interglacial climatic transition at the two sites was accomplished in only about half a century. So the rate of change uh, here was almost certainly as fast as it was in records, for example, the Greenland ice core. Um, and that's, I think, very significant in, in that with, there was in Greenland, there was nobody living uh, there at the time, but here there certainly was. There were there were people, very important uh, human settlement in the late glacial and into the early Holocene. And so the climatic changes, the very dr dramatic climatic changes at the at this transition would have been experienced by people within a human lifetime. So I, I think this is important, um, both climatically and potentially archaeologically. 
Okay, so my uh, the remaining part of the talk, I'm going to focus on my fourth challenge, which is uh, linking what I've called here paleo science with the historical record. And I'm going to do that for what is unit one of the NAR sequence that covers the last 2,600 years. And if we do have VARB records with a, a tight, tight and very precise um, chronology, then it allows us, I think, potentially to correlate with historical events or periods without the kinds of risks that you would have if you're using radiocarbon dating. Now, this is a phenomenon that Mike Bailey described in a paper many years ago now as suck in and smear, uh, which I won't elaborate on, but essentially if we've got radiocarbon chronologies, then uh, there's inevitably gonna be a statistical error associated with that. And there's a real risk that we can mismatch um, uh, between uh, records, between proxy, say, lake sediment records and, um, and historical or archaeological data. We can also, as I highlighted in the previous slide, quantify rates and magnitude of change, and that applies not just to, to climate, but also to human impact. So, for example, how quickly did um, uh, landscapes recover following periods of, of land abandonment? Were there leads? Were there lags? and how long did they take? And I'll come back to that in a minute. It also allows us to do something which I, I'd like to think is, is takes us into um, the, the realm of, 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 of real um, kind of experimental science in the sense that it begins to allow us to test hypotheses, um, including you know, questions about what the impact and environmental and economic were of different forms of disturbance, of threat and disaster. Now, these are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, there are variants of this, but the one I put there is wars, rebellion, famine, and pestilence. So we can pick up all of those historically. So can we also pick these up in the paleo uh, limnological record? And this is something which we've done over the last decade and a half, and we've done it as linked to historians and particularly to um, uh, John Holden at Princeton and uh, a, a major initiative, not just dealing with NAR, but with, with many other things too, an initiative called the Climate Change and History Research Initiative. So let's have a little look at some of the changes in the last uh, couple of millennia. Uh, we can look at the pollen record from NAR uh, and we can identify four main phases. Um, there's a period at the early on, or much of the basal part, when we have a, um, a landscape uh, with um, the cultivation not only of cereal crops, but also tree crops, particularly olive, um, olive vine, walnut. Um, this is known quite widely known uh, in the region uh, and is labelled the base here occupation phase. We've then got a period of apparent land abandonment and rewilding when the forests come back. That's the green curve here. You can see there's a big increase in, in arboreal pollen and the cultivated crops like cereals uh, disappear or fall to very low values. Then uh, starting uh, around 950 CE, we see a new phase of land uh, use associated with agropastoralism. So the tree crops have largely disappeared. And then that continues through to the last two centuries when we get a bigger increase in uh, more industrial scale grain crops. And we can link, link that to historical periods, the early period tied to the, the late Roman or uh, early Byzantine Empire, uh, followed by the coming of the Turks, the Seljuks, the Ottomans, and then the Turkish Republic. And here are some of those uh, four horsemen of the ap apocalypse. Um, the rebellions, uh, pandemics, uh, wars, and so forth. And I think what you can see on that, uh, I'll go back one, um, if I can, let's go back. Yeah, you can see there that at this time scale, and this is looking at uh, quite a long time scale, the only one that really stands out clearly is the period of extended uh, warfare between uh, the Byzantine Empire and the Arab. Uh, um, uh, Arabs who were expanding out from uh, the deserts of the Middle East into taking over North Africa and the Levant. And uh, Anatolia, where this is located, became essentially an extended war zone uh, where there was a deliberate scorched earth policy. And um, it clearly is registered in, in the pollen record from, from, uh, from Cappadocia. 
We can also tie it to climate. Uh, here is the climate record for the same time period using oxygen isotopes, diatoms, uh, carbonate mineralogy and calcium strontium ratios. Um, and we can see two major periods, dry periods there, one in the Little Ice Age, another in the Late Roman period and two wetter periods, the first linked to the medieval climate anomaly, but another in the early Byzantine period. Um, uh, and the proxies all agree pretty well about uh, that. And this also allows us to do some uh, uh, hypothesis testing. So for example, how far was that period of abandonment, the Bashir occupation phase, uh, that societal collapse, a result of, uh, could it be linked to climate? Was there a drought? Well, the answer is no, there wasn't because uh, the drought, uh, there were droughts before and afterwards, but the main period when the um, landscape was abandoned uh, was actually a period of relatively wet climate. So, so because we can tie them directly and, and, with, and quite precisely, we can see that the, um, the phase of land abandonment cannot be attributed uh, to, to climate in this instance. So we can actually falsify that particular hypothesis which we might not otherwise have been able to do if the sediments were not like that, if we were having to, to correlate over distances using radiocarbon. Um, I'll give a, an example of uh, the link of the implications of climate um, uh, uh, in more detail from um, a, uh, an event that occurred during the middle of the um, Ottoman period. I've highlighted there the, the Jalali rebellion. So this is the late 16th century now. And uh, isotopes and diatoms from NAR show uh, an extended multi, well, multi decadal period of drought, which is also recorded in, in the tree ring record and is also recorded historically in terms of documented famine years. And that period has also been studied in great detail by an historian, Sam White, who's written a whole book about this. Um, and he, and what's, what's great about this is that it's not simply uh, a matter of taking uh, known historical event, this re major rebellion, which uh, was quite important in the long term history of the Ottoman Empire uh, to, to drought. In other words, drought, drought caused uh, societal unrest, but also to look at the precise societal mechanisms by which that occurred. Why did this drought have the effect that it did, whereas other droughts didn't? And because he had the historical evidence to show that it could be linked to uh, extension of the the Ottomans into and their armies into the gates of Vienna, um, that their supply lines were overextended and so forth. You could actually look at the 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 the, the ways that the climate um, uh, interacted with society in a way that we couldn't if we didn't have those uh, textual sources. Okay, the final substantive um, uh, topic I'm going to pick up to illustrate uh, linking paleo science and history is 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 erosion. Now, some of you may know that Cappadocia is, is actually quite a famous landscape for its um, badlands, and you can see some of them in the photos here. Um, they are quite a major tourist destination. Um, they've, the badlands, the, the hoodoos have been carved into to create rock dwellings, and inside them are, uh, some of them were Byzantine uh, churches with wall paintings. So it's a very um, uh, kind of iconic landscape. And you can see from this um, image of Nar that the badlands also extend into part of the catchment of the lake, just a, a small area, but which is actively eroding at the present day. <coughs> and we can trace that because uh, in unit one in particular, the, the, the laminations, the varves are interspersed with clastic layers, ter essentially turbidites. Some of them quite thick. That one's about three centimeters thick. This one only uh, about one or two millimeters thick. And we were able to count those both visually and using uh, eye tracks through Samantha Alcock's uh, work and picking up indicators like titanium calcium ratio. And the red dots in the bottom graph here show individual turbidites or clastic layers. And in the, the other graph, we can see the, 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 the total thickness of them um, for each 50 year interval. And we can see that, that these uh, clastic layers really cluster in 
to a number of time periods. They're not evenly spread over time. Essentially, there's three groups of them in classical period. Then there's a gap. Then there's another big peak in early medieval times. Whoops. And then there's a peak in the last two centuries. And we can tie that quite directly to the land use history from the pollen. And we can see, for example, that periods of higher erosion are associated with periods of greater uh, agricultural land use, partly um, uh, cereal cultivation and, and uh, tree crops, but I think very importantly also uh, grazing animals. I think that, that actually played a very important role um, because I think we know today, as I'm sure in the past, herds of sheep and goats were brought to Nar. Uh, where there are springs for watering, and I'm sure this had a significant impact. What's also interesting, though, is that uh, when the human footprint was taken off and the landscape recovered and was uh, rewilded, that actually erosion slowed down again. So actually, it, not only are we able to, to tie, uh, in this case, the, the, the erosion record primarily to human land use rather than, for example, climate, but also to show that there's the potential for landscape recovery uh, if uh, the, light, the correct land use, uh, sustainable land use, uh, can be applied. And that's, I think, a useful lesson thinking about how we can use the past to, to uh, as a guide for future environmental management. And finally, just to end up saying that the work we've done linking paleoscience and history we hope will be uh, the subject of an exhibition uh, which had been due to take place um, last year in Istanbul at uh, this gallery um, uh, linked to one of the universities there. It's been delayed and I, we're hoping probably next year that it'll take place um, uh, linked to the uh, CCHRI. And one of the centerpieces of this is going to be a timeline based on the Nar Vard sediments. So this is a mock-up uh, showing a, a photograph of the of the, the Vards and historical events, some of them local, some of them international, um, which can be placed in time on that. <clears throat> and that image will, will cover the last 2,600 years at true scale. So it will be six meters long and go along the walls at the exhibition hall. So that's something I think uh, in terms of kind of outreach and, and, and public engagement, which uh, I think we don't always think about when we're looking at VARB sediments. But um, so I hope this will be something quite um, novel if it does come off as we hope. So just to uh, round off, I've been talking for a good 40, 35, 40 minutes now. Um, I think uh, just to really summarize what I've said already, I think there is a value in multi-lake, multi-year uh, monitoring if we are to um, make sure that the sediment records that we're using uh, uh, are truly understood in terms of the forcings that create them and valves um, allow us to do that. Um, uh, was it Donald Rumsfeld who had known knowns and unknown unknowns? Um, well, you know, at the risk of pushing this, I, I think VARB sediments allow some unknowns to become known. Uh, and that's, I think, important because that allows us to uh, have a greater degree of certainty about uh, our reconstructions. Um, uh, it, in other words, we're kind of opening up the black box and, um, and getting inside a bit more detail. Uh, I think very importantly, VARF chronologies are not just about how, how old something is, but also about rates of change. And finally, the, the, the point that I've been discussing in the last few minutes about linking with historical events, which allow uh, hypothesis testing <coughs> and assessment of relative impact and resilience to uh, different shocks, wars, pandemics, but also climatic events as well. So um, I think that'll do for today. So thank you all very much. Um, maybe there are some questions.